This says something about our philosophy to people. This says to people, this says to God, people will like this. I'm really trying to just itch the ears of people because I want them to like this. That in and of itself has something to say about our theology. It says, well, the nature of the song is what's going to bring about the life change. It's going to be about these notes that we can play in sequential order. It's going to be about this awesome chord progression and the hookiness of the song. That's song-centric music. Not a good idea for worship ministry, OK? Here's what I want to suggest to you. Scripture-centric. I want to start backwards this time. Scripture-centric music, in its methodology, the outworking of it is using songs that are rich in scriptural content. Travis gave a verse for that. Colossians 3.16. Am I hitting this home yet? Let the word Christ dwell in you richly. Richly. The outworking <coughs> is we are using songs that are rich in scriptural content according to the precedent, stand, uh, precedent given by the Apostle Paul in Colossians 3.16. This informs our philosophy. So the, 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 the philosophy then says, well, it's, it's the word of God. It's the word that changes people. It's the word that invites the Holy Spirit to come and dwell upon us. It's the word that creates a good worship experience. And what does this say about our theology, what we think about, about God? Truth changes people. Truth changes people. Not songs, not rhythms, not melodies. Truth changes people. That's a good spot for an amen. <laughs> Truth changes people. That's awesome. Okay? We use songs that are rich in scriptural content. We believe that the word is, is what's doing the active ingredient there, and it's the truth that changes people. But do you guys understand how we need to really kind of take an interest in understanding these three concepts here, how our theology informs our philosophy, and how our philosophy will inform our methodology? It's giving an intellectual kind of uh, grab and a grid to kind of put everything that we do as we minister uh, to, to the people that we serve through this. So we really need to take a look at some of our methods and say, okay, what are my methods saying about my philosophy? This, your methods are saying something. Your methods are saying something about what you actually think you want to do. And then in terms, what is your philosophy? What is that saying about your theology? What do you think about God? Are you representing God accurately? Are you worshiping him and honoring him by representing him to your to the people that you're serving accurately? Something to really consider. Well, it's been a very uh, interesting and exciting concept for me to look at the practice. Okay, let's uh, regain uh, our sort of let's uh, revisit where we're leaving off here. Uh, I want to go into a practical list of considerations that need to be thought through in terms of how each element can honor God and serve people. This next section, folks, I just want to kind of give the nuts and bolts, and I want to make it quite quick. But uh, I just want to go through the nuts and bolts of saying, okay, well, if we're going to use music as a service to people, what does this actually look like? What is the practical, you know, outworking of this? So the first thing is keys of songs. Are the songs that you're doing for guys and girls? Let me let me give you just some basic some basic knowledge right now. Uh, don't be the fool that says I can't sing in this key. Songs that are high aren't necessarily because of the key. They're the setting of the melody. Melodies and music uh, will typically bank, the choruses will typically uh, be centered around the third of the chord, of the, of the song the key's in, or the fifth of the chord. Don't be an ignorant music person and say, well, I can't sing in the key of G, because you can have a melody that's not set at a note that is too high for you to sing that's still in the key of G. It's, you know, you get people all the time that are just, you know, for whatever reason they don't know, and they, they say, well, I can't sing in that key. No, it, it's nothing to do with the key. It has to do with where it's set. Figure out where the, where the musical setting is. And don't sing songs that are too high for girls or guys to sing. Why? It's because it's not about showing off how high you can sing. It's not about how great you sound on the platform. It's about making an opportunity for everybody to enter in. Okay? So one of the rules that I use is I typically don't choose settings that exceed a D or an E. Why? Because altos, if you, if you know your music theory, are going to break at a D. 
and a lot of baritones are going to break at that same spot as well. Some a little higher, some a little lower. But that's kind of a good rule of thumb. And let me tell you, I'll, I'll be honest with you, with, with the groups that I've traveled with, I have fought this to the T and I've stood my ground. Because a lot of the time, it's a lot easier to play a song for a guitarist with those nice open sounding uh, chords in the key of E than it is to drop it down to C or D. But you know what, at the end of the day, it's not about how great your open tuning sounds. It's about whether or not people have the opportunity to, to worship God, to enter in, and to be able to sing. People will not sing if it's too high. They will not. If it is too high, they will not sing. You gotta remember, the majority of the people that we're leading are not musical. So they don't know how to inflect their voice or drop an octave, or they, they will just, if it's, too, if, it, if, it, if it's too high, they will just simply not sing. Choose songs that are in keys that are singable. Second thing, arrangement of tunes. Are you choosing a string of songs just for ease of key change? We talked about that earlier. Be creative. Don't be constricted to the songs of light keys. Learn to arrange segues that foster need of key change. Make your arrangements conducive to a worship environment. Ask, does the arrangement reflect the content of the song? If you are singing a song which lyrical content is very lamenting, Brian Dirksen wrote a song from Psalm 13, How Long, O Lord, will you, will you leave me in despair? Look on me and answer, O God, my Father. You know what? That probably isn't a good song to put to a, a high tempo or clapping or whatnot. That's probably a good song, a lament song, to be very, especially if it's a minor key, to be kind of low key. So let your arrangement reflect that. Mm -hmm. you Conducive. Conducive. C O N D U C I V E. To a worship environment. Ask, does the arrangement reflect the content of the song? Know your church culture, let the music serve that. If you are serving a 65 plus congregation, it's not time to crank up the electric guitars. Let your arrangements be filtered through the wisdom that comes from knowing your people. Song selection. Why are you uh, choosing particular tunes? What goes into your consideration? Why are you picking particular tunes? What goes into your consideration? Are you choosing them because you like them or because they serve a greater purpose? Remember what we talked about. Why are you choosing songs? Bank on truth. Sing truth. <laughs> Instill truth. Truth is what changes people. There's no note that I can play that's going to change your life. But the Word of God changes people. Choose songs that contribute to a bigger vision or theme. Consult your pastor. Serve his vision for the service and choose songs with intentionality. Seek what your congregation needs to hear or be taught. Songs teach. Don't be fooled. You are teaching. With the songs you use, you better know what you're teaching, especially if people come up afterwards with questions. Number four, stage presence. Your disposition on the stage is a direct reflection of what you were saying. You catching that? Your disposition on the stage is a direct reflection of what you were saying. Let your stage presence reflect the truth of what you were singing. Have you ever been in a church where, you know, there's somebody up on the platform and they are just like totally not engaging at all. They look like they do not want to be up there. They are totally disengaging. Wrong person to having to lead in congregational worship. Your disposition reflects the lyrics you are singing. Here's some ideas. Pray out your lyrics. Use them in your devotional life. Live them out. Use them in your devotional life. Live them out. Know that you are the permission giver on stage. You are the permission giver on stage. How you lead in terms of expression is what will be permissible in your church body. How you lead in terms of expression is what will be permissible in a church body. You would be surprised at how far a little invitation will go. Every weekend I'm in different churches across uh, the eastern side of the U.S. And I, it is amazing what a little invitation will do. I will be at a Baptist church that maybe traditionally will not have any expression. But we'll sing a song, you know, uh, Unchanging by Chris Tomlin. So we raise up holy hands. Hey, church, this morning, why don't we, why don't we put our words to action to do what these others are singing? It's biblical. Maybe I might reference that with a verse. And I just invite them to do that. And then I do it myself. I am the permission giver. People will respond to that. People will enjoy the freedom that you have now created by inviting them to do that. You are the permission giver. Okay? Know that you're the permission giver on stage. How you lead in terms of expression is what will be permissible in a church body. Are you teaching biblical expressions to respond to God? Are there some you haven't taught, and why not? Questions to consider. Glasses, production, lights, aesthetics. This could be banners, flags. If you come from a more charismatic background. Uh, the volume of what's going on. D, stage effects, fog, etc. 